What we're trying to do here at Golden Valley Charter School is really make the work of Rudolf Steiner, as it's manifested in Waldorf education, available to families who want, who want it and may not have the means to pay for a private education. So being in the public sector, there's no tuition, no book fees, none of those things. Um, so families, even if they're really living in poverty, can still bring their, ki their children to our school. And do you, do you have to make compromises in terms of the kind of school you run? Because you're not, you're getting money from the state. Oh, so in terms of regulations. I would say that we actually have more record keeping to do. Certainly the bureaucracy part, because we're receiving money from the state, we have to do a lot of reporting in that respect. But that's on the business side. In terms of how the children receive the education, I feel that we don't have to make compromises, actually. And it's because of the charter school movement that we're able to do this. Even though the charter school movement is a political, and it was birthed out of a political process, nonetheless, it allows us to, to bring Waldorf education to the public sector, is what it does. So it's a gift. Is there no downside to it? I, mean, uh... I, don't, I don't see a downside to it. I mean, we have to do, like I said, more of the business work, but the reward we get for app in the end is, um, is huge for us. So I don't see a downside in it. In a way, the marriage of the private Waldorf School and the public Waldorf School is actually helping us become more accountable to what we are doing. Sometimes when you have to do a lot of reporting, even though it is time consuming, it also helps you look at what you're doing and reflect on what you're doing and why you're doing it and become very clear about it. And I would say that that's what we're in the process of doing. It's an ongoing process. What, what for you is the essence of what Steiner uh, brought to the little area of education. What's the nub of it? Okay. For me, the nub of it is, I actually describe it in this way, it's the heart, and that is the relationship between the teacher and the students, and how the teacher looks at the students, observes the students, and brings um, the curriculum to the student to meet the student's needs. So it's a combination of bringing the curriculum in and then seeing what the students need. I think that's at the heart of it. And, and uh, I mean, surely there would be many teachers who would say that's what they try to do anyway, in whatever system they work. True. And I think that because of the teachings of Rudolf Steiner, what he brought is a way to look at the children in a different way than teachers do in the mainstream. I was a mainstream teacher for about 20 years before I came to this school 12 years ago, and I think I did a good job, and I was working with people who did a very good job, and it was very different than what we're doing here in terms of um, meeting the needs of the children, not just academically, but they're also their feeling needs. Um, in the end, their uh, abstract thinking skills, so that they will have the ability, hopefully, in the future to help us solve some of our challenges that we have in the world. In the parent information meetings, I say to the parents, it's going to be new thinking that is gonna help us with all these challenges that are coming down the road, so to speak, for us. It isn't going to be the old thinking. And in order to have new thinking, you have to have imagination. You have to be able to imagine that there's a, another way of doing things. And I believe that that's what Waldorf education helps our children do. Is that um, to do with the curriculum and also when you teach the timing of okay. teaching certain subjects? Yes, would like? I would say it's a combination. It's a combination of this curriculum that Rudolf Steiner brought us, the Waldorf curriculum, and it's a combination. What goes along with the curriculum is the teacher's actual 
personal self-development. So the teacher is continually on a path of um, developing him or herself. And then that, both of those together is what makes it uh, different than other educations. You can teach the methods without the training, but that isn't Waldorf education. To me, Waldorf education is the combination of the teacher on this path of self-discovery, which is what they get in the training and continue as they go through their life, hopefully, and the curriculum that they're teaching. Can you describe to me what your understanding of Steiner's picture of the child and, and in a sense the thought that human being is? Right. So the human being is a, the way I explain it in the public sector to the parents when I have a parent information meeting, um, is a threefold being. So we have the tagline, you know, educating the head, heart, and hands. So that that is a picture of what we are doing, helping the child to do, is to help them develop the strongest physical body they can, help them develop the feel, their own feeling life in a, a mature way. And um, then, when they've done that, the intellectual starts to um, be born, so to speak, and um, then in, eventually they're able to impart direction to their life, one of the famous quotes of Rudolf Steiner. Some people have, have found the world of education uh, too, too slow for the children and maybe not pushing them enough. I mean, right. what do you say to that? I say that we start on a slow path and because we're starting on a slow, slower path than the mainstream, we're actually building a stronger foundation for the children. Stronger physical body, stronger character, if you will, or feeling life, so that we see it happen. And actually, we even see it in our test scores. The children are academically low in the early grades, first, second, third grade, but by the time they get to the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they are so capable. They're capable um, with their academics. They're capable in their music, as we saw earlier in the seventh grade uh, recorder playing. They're capable with their main lesson books. They're very articulate. And they're capable mathematically. Yeah. And they're not stressed, little stressed human beings, hopefully, then. That is true. Yeah. Now, there's some, I mean, honestly, there's some, um, some amount of stress is good. I mean, we have to, we can't always be in lukewarm water. So there's a, there is some amount of stress, but it's a, a stress that is healthy in, in that it's helping our children grow. So when you have to learn the lines of a play, that's stressful, but that's the kind of stress that is, um, can be accomplished by the children and when they accomplish it and they have a wonderful performance that builds their self-esteem, that builds their sense of who they are and that they are capable. I was hired to open this Waldorf school. It was to be the first Waldorf Methods public high school. That's what I was hired to do here in this district. And I had a year to prepare. And in June of that year, they told me that I wouldn't be just opening the school, 
I would be put on a campus which um, housed the California's most prevalent, persistently failing school by every measure. Um, they weren't graduating kids, they weren't test, uh, test everything was just terrible, terrible, behavior, everything really bad. <laughs> um, and so with, uh, we brought, we opened our school in September. Now what, what was it like when you came there? When uh, there was gang activity. We called the police two, three times a day. We had regular drug busts. We confiscated um, many, many ounces of marijuana over the school year. Uh, we had many fights that we were breaking up in classrooms, outside of classrooms. There were maybe two or three thefts a day. Yeah. And the attitude of the teaching staff? Everyone was ready for a change. Um, the staff I inherited um, was not um, a, set, a competent staff. I was able to bring in several um, Waldorf-trained or partly trained teachers. What was the atmosphere I, like in the place, um, apart from all this crime? <laughs> <laughs> well, I came to visit one day before to see the campus before we actually opened, and the the students were testing and I walked into a classroom, brand new classroom with windows looking out onto the garden and, and into the sky, but they were covered with paper, white butcher paper, and I asked the principal at the time, why have you covered the windows? And she said, well, the students are testing and they should have no distractions. And I, um, I guess my stomach sunk at the time because I thought if uh, nature, if seeing clouds and birds and the blue sky was a distraction, there was no hope for public education. And in fact, um, from then on, our goal was really to get the kids outside as much as possible. That the garden that we wanted to plant was um, was really uh, the, the, going to be the source of our success, getting kids outside working. And the days when we are outside all day working, the kids say, wow, um, this is much more fun than school. And I remind them that it is school. Yeah, we're going to break, take a break, take a break from it now, Ruben. So we're going to wash, we're going to wash them now. So grab, grab a bunch of garlic and peel them off so that they are clean and then wash them off in the, in the bucket. So one of the things I think we're most successful at is um, getting kids outside the classroom. And there's a few boys out there who I think in another environment would be suspended, expelled, moved from school to school because of behavior problems and yet um, they are very bright and they're very active and they're out here moving piles of dirt and um, finding success around the campus um, with big physical activities and big complicated building projects and I think that's one of the things we're doing well not only with the students but helping teachers realize that what goes on in the classroom is important but what's more important is they're all around success. There's success perhaps outside the classroom too and that one feeds the other. So they're, they're self-confidence in other words. Then. Okay, nice, clean. Yeah. Screw over the rest of the world. See, and now we can hang them and then they dry vampires. and then they are ready for sale. A ward off sparkly vampires. Extra one, they can come up. Dude, and it's not a vampire, he's a fairy. Yeah, and it also keeps the vampires away by the way. Which is a good thing. I don't like vampires. We're trying to implement Waldorf methods. We're trying to um, invigorate and inspire public education by implementing Waldorf methods. And what do you understand by Waldorf methods? What's the essence of what you're trying to bring? Well, certainly on a very basic level, I think it's the arts, integrating the arts uh, throughout the curriculum. Today you saw um, evidence of that with the choir singing. It's taken two and a half years to find a teacher who can be, bring singing to the campus, so that's been an odyssey in and of itself. Um, we have an active drama club so that students uh, can uh, participate in that. Uh, but also, um, you know, I think it's the way that we work together as a faculty, um, collaboratively, uh, with our students uh, gaining input. I mean, I think that that's something, there's some fundamental differences when we talk about Waldorf education or Waldorf methods um, around the way schools are run and operated and the way classrooms are run. Um, that um, it's not about instruction and application so that students acquire information so that they can do well on tests, 
we're interested in inspiring students' intellectual curiosity and asking them to think creatively. And that's really fundamentally different than the public schools in our school district. And, it, and has that been difficult for you to implement? I mean, is there opposition to that? Uh, you know, there has been. Uh, when we first came, uh, when we first started, I think that um, my perception is that the administration, the superintendent, and the leaders of the district were doing things that, uh, throwing roadblocks in our way that would make our success very challenging and, um, and very unlikely. Um, but we have a new superintendent now for a year and a half, and we can see the enormous change. There's um, great support for what we're doing. This is a superintendent who sees the value in a wide variety of educational options for students. So whereas I was being reprimanded and criticized and actually laughed at for putting in a garden and fruit trees in an orchard. At this point, we have a district-wide system and policy for all schools to put in gardens and fruit trees, composting and this sort of yeah. thing. So you're influencing the, the system generally? Hopefully. I hope so. I hope so. We like to think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But have you had to compromise too? I mean, in terms of the Waldorf ideals? You know, we're, we're two and a half, we're almost three years old. We've been in operation three years, so um, the compromises that we're beginning, and we haven't been able to start our school um, exactly as we would like it to be. Um, and I think the compromise for me has been an acceptance that there is a process, that over time I can slowly implement um, each year new things and new ideas. We have to have credentialed teachers, and I think that's one of the... Um, the joys but also challenges is that we take people who have a California State credential who are interested in Waldorf education but don't necessarily have training. Yeah. Uh, so in, in some ways we're building the, the um, what do you call that, the, um, we're spreading the influence of Waldorf education by recruiting new teachers and training them. All of our teachers do go to Rudolf Steiner College and are in involved in the full high school training program there. Um, so it's a slow process. So I think if that's a compromise, that's one we're making. We do have union issues. Teachers work by a union contract, which we honor. Um, but it's also, it's also exciting, because I think Steiner wanted us to use the resources at our disposal. We're using taxpayers' dollars in a public education, and we're transforming the school. Because there are purists who think that a Waldorf school should be a Waldorf school and uh, that's something untouchable. Yeah, and um, you get 300 kids who can afford to pay ten to $30,000 a year to go there and my students don't pay anything. And th there is a difference. There is a, a financial difference. I don't have those dollars to spend on the incredible diversity of offerings a private school has. I don't have strings. I can't afford a strings teacher here. And yet, you saw the music teacher and what she's able to do in three months with 30 kids. She started with 10. Three months later, she has 30, and she's got another 60 in the audience waiting to join next year. Um, so I think we see the the incredible power of one, one little application of what you might call Waldorf methods. Um, but to me, it's, there's, a, there's a real financial situation. I, these kids would never in a million years have the opportunity to go to a private school. Uh, and I've got 300 that are getting something. Yeah, yeah. Do, is it your understanding that, that Steiner imagined that there was a an ideal school as the one started in Stuttgart and everything should be modeled on that? Or do you think that he would be quite pleased that these ideas are seeping out into mainstream? Well, if his idea was that education could renew culture, then it certainly wouldn't be only in isolated pockets of private education. Um, so my understanding is that it was... Um, to seep into many areas of our culture, not only schools, but um, in gardening and winemaking, in uh, child rearing and medicine. Yeah. Do you see that happening more and more? 
I, I think so. I think so. And again, it, it is in pockets. There are communities that are more open to it. Um, I think I, I think mainly what surprises me is that it isn't more far-reaching than it is. It, it, I think it surprises me that it isn't something that more people um, understand and admire and, yeah. and, and accept. You, you've been brought up uh, surrounded by Steiner's yeah. ideas, haven't you? You went to the Waldorf School yourself. So maybe yeah. that's harder for you to imagine. And, and living many, many years in San Francisco, another yeah. isolated <laughs> bubble of, of, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. thinking. And you've, you've partly answered this already, but I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you feel is the, the essence of what Steiner was trying to bring into education generally? and what you're mm -hmm. therefore also trying to do here? Well, I think it's individual development of the human being. It's, it's human development, and that means certainly academic and intellectual, but it, it also means, um, I think, um, inner growth, um, a personal awareness, a growing understanding of who I am, um, and a willingness to experience and experiment. Um, it's a sensitivity to oneself, not in a narcissistic or self-centered way, but that I am in a process of growth and I am willing to try new things and I am willing to take healthy risks. I, mean, I think our society is filled with people taking unhealthy risks all over the place because certainly not they're not getting those opportunities in education. And, and that's another method, I think, that we do implement here by offering many, many opportunities for our students to present, to stand up and speak publicly, uh, to um, show what they're learning to their class, to their whole school. Um, they're taking risks out in the garden, building, trying things that they have never tried before. Um, and I think that helps stretch them, stretch themselves um, in their personal growth. What about the curriculum itself? How, how, how much are you able to bring that into the, into the daily um, work? Well, we do. Um, again, that's something that's in process for us. We, um, based on the numbers of students we have and the numbers of teachers, it is impossible at this point for us to do the regular main lesson schedule where every student is in a main lesson in the morning. We offer those uh, main lesson schedule twice a year. Um, the curriculum itself in the Waldorf High School in California and in a public high school is pretty similar. Um, it's mainly the block schedule of a main lesson that um, is different between the two schools. Also, because our teachers are at various levels of their own personal training, they're at, all, they're at various levels of implementing what, you, what we would think of as the Waldorf curriculum. Because I understand that it isn't necessarily what is taught, but how it's taught, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. when it's taught. I mean, are you able to, to work with that? I would say that's definitely what we're working with, how it's taught and when it's taught. Um, to looking at ninth grade themes, for example, how can you teach... Um, English. What are the themes that need to come out of the English curriculum or the history curriculum that address the ninth grade? So we do that through the normal curriculum, but also um, through these main lessons that we offer periodically in the year. What does that bring extra then? Well, again, I think it's um, it addresses the individual student's personal needs at a particular developmental stage. And that's not something that is necessarily recognized in, in mainstream education? Oh, not in the slightest. Um, at the end of the year, we've just finished last week what's called CST, California Standards Testing, and there are a whole onslaught of one, you know, standard 1.1.2 and all the way down to however many, 35 to 40 standards per subject matter, and that's what's supposed to be taught. It's not bad stuff, you know, it's understanding where per periods go in a sentence and when you capitalize and um, when was the American Revolution, this sort of thing. But the, the intention is that students have acquired, not, uh, acquired information. And it's not about acqu acquiring knowledge or personal growth. And they have to take one test, actually they take five tests, one week, a year. 
And if they happen to have a bad day or forget it, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's how we're measured. Yeah. So it is fundamentally different, an attention to individual personal development. Yeah. How, how have the students and also their families reacted to what you're trying to bring? Is there resistance or do they respond? Well, because we are a school of choice, students opt out of their large comprehensive high school to come here. So they're making a choice to be here. And mostly what we hear the majority of the time is, why didn't I find this sooner? We have students who are very creative and artistic, who have been um, really languishing in the system, who have been failing in the system, and yet are very bright students with enormous talents. And um, they come here and find a place to flourish because we do, because they are developing and growing, and that's recognized. This is my Poetics Mean Lesson book. It was from January. This is the table of contents. Um, we did several poems. This is a welcome poem. It, like the title suggests, it welcomes you to the, the portfolio. We had to do essays about poetry and how it developed and how it spread around the world. And we also had to um, draw a map and show all of the different poets and where they came from. And this is the vocabulary flip book. And these are all the words we had to learn in, in that month. This is a poem about me. And this is probably one of my favorite poems. It's about an animal. I really like rabbits. Um, this poem is actually put in upside down by mistake. And it's about my friends. This is a poem about um, relationships, and I'm in one right now. And this is me and my boyfriend, Alan. I don't really like this poem too much, but um, we had to rearrange words that we saw. And these words were from my friend, Maggie. This is a review of a short um, skit that people in the class did. This is... Um, There's a lot of uh, physical, materialistic, what you might call branding in the private schools. I've been in these school, private Waldorf schools for 25, well, more than 25 years, 25 years as a professional, but um, since I was 12 years old. And there are things, markers, that we see that make something a Waldorf school. The hand-carved wooden sign, the colors of the walls, the beautiful aesthetic. I mean, there's nothing like a wall, the, the gardening and the landscaping of a Walder School, Sacramento Walder School with the river running by on, on county park land. Um, even the flowing skirts of the teachers, quite honestly. <laughs> um, these are things that people say are a Waldorf School. And um, what happens when you take people who want to make a Waldorf school and you plop them into a brand new, totally arid, antiseptic campus, how do they make that a Waldorf school? You know, you can't, um, there's something about the growth and, and, um, and change over time, evolution, that I think also makes a Waldorf school. And I would say that's where we can be a Waldorf school, in the becoming of one in the intention of creating and implementing in response to the community before us that's working with us. Um, so it's living in an invisible realm, really, in our feelings and our intentions and how we implement that. And that doesn't look like a hand-carved wooden sign. I get the district giving me a manufactured plaque, which is lovely, and I'm grateful for it. <laughs> um, because it's a gesture that is familiar to me of recognition and admiration. Um, and eventually I'll get that hand-carved wooden plaque. <laughs> do, do you think there's a danger in, in sort of mainstream Waldorf, and in a sense with maybe many of the initiatives that have sprung out of 
Schleiner's ideas, that they get a bit stuck. Mainstream meaning the private schools? N I mean the, the Waldorf schools. That they get stuck? Yes, that there's a, almost um, yeah, a, even a rigidity sometimes, a lack of flexibility. Steiner said this, Steiner said that. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. We, one hears that, and I can hardly... Yeah, one hears that. Um, when you get to perfection, where do you go? Where do you keep evolving and growing and changing? Here, we're so far from perfect that it's really easy and totally satisfying every day to see the change and to see them move forward. But where, where you're in a place that is really genuinely nearly perfect, where you have the most gorgeous second grade hand knit dolls. Those are treasures that the children produce. You know, it'll be decades before we get there at the high school level. Um, so I don't know. That's the rigidity of perfection or the danger of perfection. Yeah, but I, also I can see that maybe your challenge to create something that hasn't existed before, rather than just becoming like the Sacramento Waldorf oh, School. You know, we know that very clearly. We know that we are developing something different, and we don't intend to remake Sacramento Waldorf High School or San Francisco Waldorf High School, and there's, um, as wonderful as they are, um, I can speak very personally about that, um, but this isn't an intention of remaking or copying that. Um, the other reality is that those schools are partly where they are because they've had families and children in there for 20, 30 years. They've grown up in the system. We have people coming who've never heard of Waldorf. They certainly don't know who Steiner is. Um, and they can't even say the word Waldorf, quite honestly. So we are a kind of stepping stone. I think that, the, just like we see in public education, one size doesn't fit all. I think that's true of Waldorf schools. That if you were to take some of my students and plop them into a private school, say Sacramento Waldorf School down the street, um, they, they're not ready for that yet. They're not ready for that intensity. And I think it's um, uh, that um, having a different kind of offering for a different kind of person is OK. And that doesn't make it less, lesser. It makes it different. I mean, Liz, this is a, a very beautiful school. Yes, it is. Uh, and people have to pay to come here. Uh, what, yes. <laughs> what, what do you think about the charter school movement? It, I, I think it's um, a complicated and interesting condition. I don't, I don't have a strong for or against. I think we're on a journey of discovery. Um, clearly, the impulse of Waldorf education is becoming wider, more widely known. Um, clear, appreciated and I believe appreciated. Um, so some of the impulse of Board of Education is becoming available to more children through through the charter schools. Uh, it's a complicated dance at this point. Uh, what is what is complicated about it? Um, well, in this country in particular, I would say all of the questions around freedom and education, of uh, you know, First Amendment concerns what can be translated, what cannot be, what the impact of the charter movement is on the independent schools, what the impact of the independent schools is on the charter schools. So we're, we're, it, it's, it's a dynamic, very interesting. Yes. But it's interesting, you, you use the word dynamic, yes. so you think that something to be learned on both sides then? I believe there's a lot to be learned on both sides, yes, yes. Because, you know, you do hear criticism sometimes of not just Board of Education, but an awful lot of Steiner's legacy, that it's a bit stuck. Yes. Um, I don't yes. know whether you would uh, agree with that. But. Well, I, I think that's a little complicated too. I, I mean, I think we have this incredible impulse for education. We have an extraordinary curriculum based on the human being. 
And we have a very strong mandate to make it contemporary at all times, to ask who are the children, what is the time. So I think part of what's happening with the charter schools is that we're having to examine what is essential. Um, and I think that is ultimately going to be in both, I don't want to use the word camps, but in both groups, the independent schools and the charter schools. So in a way in this country we've got a unique experiment going on. Um, yeah. So that in, you're saying that in, in a way, in terms of demands made on the charter schools, that might prompt not only them but also you to actually not necessarily rethink but think more deeply about what's the essence of what you're trying to do. Well, I would hope we're continuing to think deeply, but, uh, but I, I think it does call into question how do, we, how, do we, how do we provide this education in this time, how do we make it available? Um, how do we manage the independent schools because I think there's a level of work that can go on there that is essential and how do we work in colleagueship. So. What, what, uh, what is it that appeals to your parents here? Why do they send the children to this school? I think there are a number of things. I mean you, you've seen the setting, there's no question that that's a draw. Our children grow up in this extraordinary setting. Uh, they, we have a farm, we have animals, we have crops. Uh, we have fields, there's a lot of indoor, outdoor opportunity. We have the, a full curriculum, we offer the entire curriculum from K through 12. Um, we have a community, it's a strong community so people find a home and there's that feeling of raising children together a little bit. Um, the factor of choice I think is in there, that, that this is a a group of parents who, for whatever combination of reasons, are choosing an alternative path. And clearly that's true in the charters as well. But by the time you get to the independent sector, I think that's, that's a really strong factor. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and what, what is the essence, in your opinion, of what the Board of Education is trying to do? Where is it different? Wow. <laughs> uh, the essence. Well, I think it's, I, mean, I really do think it's trying to create capacities for the future. You know, if we take this picture that we see the real fruits of the work when, when these young people are in, in their adult life, that means we're always forward thinking, we're always looking to the future. And I think we are that, that truism of we're trying to develop freedom and thought, capacities of creativity, problem solving. Um, and what we see over and over again is also combined with that confidence, with this idea that yes, they can do, and they can, they can confidently step out into the world, which takes some doing right now, I think. So. I, I gather many parents, particularly parents of younger children, are also drawn to water schools because they feel the children aren't too pressurised too early. And I think that's there and I think it's a conflict. Uh, it requires trust from parents to say, I will go more slowly in a society that is pushing, pushing, pushing further and further down. So we know that we're asking parents to, even though we're confident, to take a leap of, in a way, a leap of faith. Um, but yes, there's the respect for childhood, space for childhood, play, um, yeah. And the curriculum itself, it's, it's After, not just, I mean, it's, it, it's not yeah. just what you teach, but when you teach and it. How you teach it. Yeah, and yeah. how you teach yeah. it. And how you teach it. So I think yes. there's, you know, this marvellous picture of the human being and a curriculum that comes so clearly from that picture. And then the teacher is the artist at the end of it. How do I bring that alive for these children? Yeah. But, so, but the curriculum is brilliant. <laughs> I gave this curriculum nearly a hundred years ago now. Yeah. You still feel, I mean, you've been a teacher yourself, I've been a that teacher, it's yes. relevant. I think it's highly relevant. Um, you know, to watch the children at every stage being ready for what's going to be presented to them is, is extraordinary. So I think it's highly relevant. Yeah, yeah. Possibly more so now than ever.